Um, so first, what is Nexen? That's, that's the marketing part. Uh, then the challenge that I'm working on. Um, smart data versus dumb data. Uh, no, you can read it. Okay, Nexen. Um, the bank basically wants to transform itself into what they call now a digital enterprise, uh, a technology company. Uh, the, the world is digitizing uh, at a very rapid pace. Um, every, the bank becomes basically one giant computer um, with some bankers as well. Uh, but mostly IT people. So the focus, the focus goes to IT. Um, and all big, bigger banks say that now. Gold, I heard Goldman, Goldman Sachs is saying it. Uh, ING in Holland is saying it. Um, uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, they all say we want to become a technology company. So that's a big change that's going on. Um, and that has to do with disruption. Uh, this, uh, this, the, the reason why I started working for this bank is because I had a, heard a speech of the CIO, Suresh Kumar, um, and he was saying, um, uh, basically he wants to become the Amazon of finance, because he wants to say, if before we are being disrupted uh, by, uh, by small, small startups, we better do it ourselves. Uh, you see that, um, you see that in all, in all industries like retail, uh, in retail, Amazon and eBay have changed the world dramatically. Uh, you see it in travel, in communications, uh, you see it everywhere. And now also in finance. Uh, finance is my, maybe one of the last markets that is about to be disrupted. Uh, you see blockchain and, but, and also knowledge graph. Um, okay, let's skip this one. That's all marketing. Um, so you see that we, we currently have um, uh, yeah, 185,000 online users, uh, many different roles and industries. Uh, this is the current situation where we have uh, 15 client platforms, uh, many systems. Uh, we have basically have thousands of systems, uh, half a million tables. Uh, it's it's one giant. Uh, I won't say mess. Sorry, that's that's the. That's the the wrong word, but it's it's siloed. There's, there are many silos, hundreds. Um, the next digital ecosystem that we are trying to create is basically trying to unify uh, in all kinds of different levels all those silos. Uh, basically, we, would, we, we want our customers to have one interface, just like Amazon uh, AWS is creating all these interfaces, but they're one consistent set of interfaces uh, rather than connecting to all kinds of different systems with different technologies, you would like to have one core technology, which we call the Nexen APIs. It's all REST-based. Uh, so basically all bigger systems in the bank, all the back office systems are now translating their interfaces into what we call the Nexen APIs. But then if you would just do that, then you would still have uh, all those different silos, uh, all those different data models. And so if you would like to know the position of the bank against uh, IBM as a customer and a partner, and there's so many different relationships to a company like that, then you probably would still have to call dozens of APIs and get with different primary keys and, re and, the and the results would be returned in all kinds of different data sets and data models. You would still have to do all the, the hard work to, to make make it one semantically consistent, uh, give one consistent result. So um, we, we cannot just unify the APIs, we also have to unify the data. And that's uh, where, uh, where my team comes in. This is the Nexon data team, where we uh, try to do things. Uh, it's, it's more research so far. We try to do things in a fundamentally different way uh, using semantic technology, because um, uh, Basically, it started with my, my boss, uh, Raj Patil, who was uh, basically the chief data officer of the bank. Uh, he was uh, used to work for UBS as the chief data officer, and then for the Google on the Google Knowledge Graph, where, you know, and he's like me, like myself, working for years on, uh, on semantic technology. And uh, yeah, he got the opportunity to, uh, to convince the CIO to, to go for semantic technology as uh, a potential, I'm not saying the way, but a potential solution for uh, a, a, a whole number of problems. So let's let's talk about the, those problems, the challenge. Uh, so our current data landscape, uh, 
consists of, uh, like I said, uh, half a million tables. Uh, uh, that's just Oracle. Uh, that's not, not counting all the other technologies. Thousands of systems, uh, more than 100 uh, different technologies. Um, then we have to deal with all kinds of regulatory uh, requirements. Uh, BMO and Mellon is a bank too big to fail, so we have to create a living will and, and, and all the regulatory requirements for that as well. Uh, we have, uh, of course, BCBS uh, 239. That's, I think, the most used term today. <laughs> um, and uh, many other regulatory requirements all across the globe. Uh, but the, f the funny thing is that those regulatory com com requirements actually make sense. Uh, they are just common sense questions. Like, if you provide me as a regulator, provide me some data, then can you please explain uh, where that data comes from? Where, who, who says so? Does it come from your spreadsheet or does it come from system? Uh, uh, how many systems were involved? Uh, tell me exactly where it came from, how the lineage works. Uh, explain to me uh, every step uh, along the way, all the way to the authoritative source. Uh, to, uh, explain to me in a machine-readable way uh, that uh, which which versions of the pro programs that have been uh, used to calculate or aggregate that data. Um, so we, we need to do a lot of more, a lot more work to make that happen, to make the, the to to do the fundamentally right thing. Um, okay. So and then yeah, another part of the challenge is uh, the, the technology disruption, where we have to deal with, uh, of course, the big data. It's, it seems like it's almost exponentially growing. Uh, so it's massive. It, uh, it's, we have all this data, but how to make sense of this, of this data? How to connect the dots? Uh, then you have blockchain. And I think actually we've been discussing uh, this this morning already, but I think the combination blockchain and knowledge graph is a killer combination. And I will try to explain why. Then you have machine learning and all, the, all these new paradigms, basically, where yeah, we, need to be, we need to be able to use that in a proper way. For example, machine learning, we now have a current team of data scientists that, uh, that, that do the machine learning, but 90% of their time is spent on harvesting the data across the organization uh, and to make, to make sense of it. They shouldn't do that. They should work on machine learning, not on harvesting data. So uh, one of the, one of the uh, use cases for the knowledge graph is, uh, is to give the machine learning people the data that they need to do their work. Um, and then there's another massive change, of course. Uh, uh, this, uh, in the banks usually work with uh, with files, uh, and those files are generated in the night, in the at, at night time, intraday. Um, we need to move away from this file-oriented world uh, to a real-time world, where an event-driven world, and that's a massive change. Will take maybe decades to to go there, but it will happen. Then we have all those silos, all those different uh, technologies, uh, different companies that have been uh, acquired with their own systems, different jurisdictions, different uh, that sort of different ways of defining a silo. And you can see a silo as a line of business or a department. You can see it as uh, fr from a legal perspective, the jurisdictions that we have to deal with. Uh, but you can also look at silos in terms of technologies. Uh, the Java, Java world is completely different than the COBOL mainframe world. Uh, and they have different ways, different things to do. Um, then we have the old school system integration, um, and where uh, we are copying data all over the place. Um, so if you look at all those data sets and all those databases that we deal with, then I think a, a very conservative estimate would be that 80% of that data is not authoritative, is a copy of some other data. So data gets copied around all the time and can get stale, etc. So if you make decisions based on stale data, or, or you don't know exactly what version, or do you have the right version of the data, is that then the right decision? You don't know. And at least you cannot prove it. So um, that's my main point of this slide. Um, I would call all that data dumb data. And, and what is dumb data? Data that is not smart. That's <laughs> so uh, data that has no machine readable version definition of the meaning. That is dumb data. Uh, data that has no universally unique resolvable HTTP URL uh, identifier. 
uh, not and not only an identifier, but also a locator. We'll talk about that later. Um, data that has no standards based in the in the in their formatting, etc. Uh, data that has no no concept of byte temporality. So most databases you look at are current state databases. They assume the current state. But what if you want to see what happened over time, etc. You can, and then people, of course, they can you can do an Oracle and an SQL database. You can create your own tables and make make your own solutions for supporting by temporality. But it's not it's not built into the standard models. Uh, it's not it's, it's, it takes a lot a lot of work to have a complete by temporal picture of what happened in your bank. And uh, last but not least, uh, all of the data that we have, it's not properly normalized. So we, we are copying it all the time. There's, so we, with the one point of the knowledge graph is to have, basically to, go to, do, to, to have extreme normalization. So what do we do? We, I call this uh, triplification. So we need to get the data into smart data. And we create, make triples. So in the, we call that triplic triplification in our team. Um, so let's say you have a, a, a metric, so a, a CSV file or a table or, or whatever. Then you have a, a row and a column and a data point. Um, so how do we translate that? I can't barely read my own slides here. Um, so first we have to identify um, uh, the, the columns. The, the columns have to be identified as attributes, and those attributes can have to be mapped to an, an, a model, an ontology. So on that axis, we are doing attribute resolution. Uh, that's actually where the most work goes, um, to, to see the meaning across the different data sets. Um, where we, it's not just saying this column with the zip code is the same as the zip code there. That, that's the simple one, but uh, we, uh, you have, you have all kinds of complex constructs in one database that uh, are basically the same in another database. So for example, we're now mapping uh, JIRA uh, time registration with our H we have an H HP system called PPM that is also used for time registration. So we, we're getting the data from those two systems. They both do time registration, but they have completely different ways of s storing it. In, in PPM, you store it uh, per, per day in one record and for one week. And in, in, in Jira, you store it for all the issues that you have in Jira. So it's a, it means the same thing, but the, the underlying model is completely different. So how do you map that? Well, that, that that's the attribute resolution. And we also have uh, uh, the identity resolution, where uh, one uh, person, uh, for example, an employee, can, can be, can be uh, stored in, in many different systems, dozens of systems, usually. Uh, so we have to identify that. That's usually pretty easy because we have an internal employee ID. But still, then even then, uh, things can go uh, can go wrong. So how how do you do the identity resolution? That's a whole different field in itself. Uh, and what we are doing is to create uh, a URL for every. So instead, basically, we give a, a new primary key to every object in our universe. And then uh, you, when you have done that, then you have the values. Uh, there's also a, a value resolution there because uh, think about dates or numbers. If you say uh, this is the price and that you give me the number 100, uh, what does it mean? Is that $100 or 100? Uh, 100, what, what is that? So you have to re resolve that as well. And usually many values are actually pointers to other objects, to reference data, which is the enrichment part where we have uh, enrichment stages in our, in our data flow pipelines. So eventually, uh, well, this is very this is a simplification, of course. But eventually, you get uh, the predicate, object, subject, the triples out of this, and then you can, I think, call it smart data. Because I, if you give me a triple instead of just a cell in a CSV file, uh, then in, in a triple you can, if, if you say this is the the the, the closing price, then so okay. Um, Give me the URL to the ontology, and uh, I have a machine readable. My program can read and interpret the, that ontology and knows exactly what you're what, what you're dealing with. And then we can compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So if you look into the triple, 
So the subject is, uh, is this, uh, that's the identity. We call that the Nexon IRI. Uh, because it's not just an, an identity, it's also a locator. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's two functions for this primary key, which is different from the normal uh, primary keys. A normal primary key is just an opaque code, usually, um, or worse, it, it has meaning. But we try to create meaningless URLs uh, by just using 128-bit uh, uh, UUIDs. Um, and those, but those URLs are have this domain nexon.data in the in the in the URL. So that that means that if a system would like to see, give me all the data, give me the 360 degree picture around this identity, then um, then we can provide that. Uh, but also, if a user clicks on that link, then we would like to show an engaging web page. We call that the semantic landing page uh, or SLAP. Uh, and that's our internal system. And I'm glad that uh, Naso just uh, showed you an application of how that would look like, uh, because I cannot show my own application due to legal problems. Uh, but um, actually, the demo that he just gave, um, I, I worked with Fonto Text in, in my former uh, job in, at Bloomberg, where, where I also did the, the Bloomberg Knowledge Graph project. Um, and we started working this out, this, this uh, semantic landing page concept there. Um, and that basically means you have to, if you have billions and eventually maybe even trillions of objects in your in your knowledge graph, you cannot generate or you cannot hand code web pages for each of those uh, of those objects. So you have to generate them and you have to do that in a in a smart way. So, uh, but luckily uh, enough, we have now the ontologies, etc. All the knowledge about what the data means is in the same database, is in the same knowledge graph. So you can just generate uh, quite an interesting uh, web page, um, and people can start using it. It would potentially become a whole new way of dealing with data. It's uh, rather than going from, an, uh, let's say, an action object interface, uh, like, um, for example, the Bloomberg terminal. You have to type in the, the function code that you want to do, and then, and then you find the object that you work with most of the time. Uh, this will be an action object interface, where you go to the object uh, you search or you navigate to the objects that you want to work with, and there you find all the actions that are applicable to you in your context, uh, with your entit uh, entitlements and the contracts and all of that that are relevant to you. Uh, and then you can see all the actions that you can perform on, on that object. Then uh, the predicate side of things, uh, that's where FIBO comes in. Uh, the predicate that defines the meaning. So what does this triple mean? And then you see uh, a similar uh, IRI, uh, that's an ontology axiom IRI, um, and it points to one particular axiom in an ontology. Uh, there's one error in, I didn't fix that, the, the hash at the end should be a slash. We had a discussion in, in the ETH this week about this, but there should be a slash at the end. But uh, this is probably going to be uh, the, the, the URIs that we are going to work with, uh, where you can specify which maturity level of FIBO that you want, do you want to use, uh, and which particular version, and that's the color. You see the pink, is the, the, that's the, let's say, the, the bleeding edge version of, uh, of FIBO. And then you can say, give me the latest version, or give me version 3.2, or whatever. Um, and if you go for production purposes or regulatory purposes, then you want to use the green version, which is the OMG approved uh, ratified version. Um, and in one knowledge graph, we, we can never go down, so we have 24-7 operations, etc. So um, one line of business might use FIBO version X and another one FIBO version Y. Uh, so we need to be able to support multiple versions. Uh, in the same in the same knowledge graph um, at the same time, um, and that should even work well with reasoning. So these uh, these versions are critical for for a knowledge graph oper operation. Um, okay, more about that later, perhaps. Um, okay, so the, and then the object part, which can be either uh, another Nexon IRI or a literal value. And then we have the context or the named graph, which uh, which we use for uh, for us. The named graphs are used to represent the data sets. So um, we we process data from multiple sources. 
must clean it, uh, create, uh, map it to higher level ontologies from the source ontologies in the database to the ontologies like FIBO. And FIBO is not just the only ontology. And I would like to make that point here that FIBO is not supposed to be, I think, uh, one canonical, new, a new canonical model for the whole bank, replacing everything else. Uh, FIBO is just one ontology that you can use next to many others in the same database. So we can have multiple different versions of FIBO, but we can also have other overlapping ontologies uh, that it can all work together in one in one system. I think that is actually comes to the core of semantic technology. Semantic technology is based on the open world assumption as opposed to the closed world assumption. So this dumb data that we currently work with is all based on the closed world assumption where you have to agree Parties have to agree about the meaning of things. In the open world assumption, and that's the core of the semantic technology uh, world, uh, you, you don't have to agree. You can agree to disagree. You can, work, you can store your object uh, with your ontology, with your version of FIBO. Uh, as long as you use the same uh, identifier, I can read it and I can map it to my ontology. Um, and it can, we can work with the same object. We, we don't have to copy anything. We can work with the same object. You use your version of your schema or ontology, um, and I do work, use mine. So that is an extreme uh, change uh, in way of thinking uh, as compared to uh, other technologies. And I think actually this is the maybe the most fundamental um, driver of, uh, because so far, I don't know how many people in the room have seen uh, a, a bank uh, work with one canonical model across the firm. I mean, can someone please raise a hand? It doesn't work. It's, I've never heard of it. I've worked in many banks and I've, uh, you always see people saying, okay, we're having the canonical model, but the canonical model of today is something else than the canonical model of tomorrow. So you already have multiple versions to deal with. Let alone that you have all these different lines of business, they will never agree on using one canonical model. So the whole the whole concept of a canonical model, in my in my eyes, is 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 actually it's it's just a dream. Um, I think a knowledge graph comes much closer to that dream than the current way of doing things. Okay, what's the next knowledge graph? Uh, this is yeah, kind of an example of what kind of data would be would be put in there. Uh, I would say all data, but uh, that's a little bit far down the road maybe. But let's start with uh, let's start with the core uh, the core objects of what makes a bank a bank. Yeah, so you have the customers and the contracts, especially the contracts. Um, you have all the products, etc. Let's let's get them from all the authoritative sources. Actually, let's try to make a model of who are the authoritative sources. That's another question. Many, many uh, people, uh, it's in the heads of people, but there's no system out there that says exactly this person is, uh, this system is owned by this person and that person owns this particular attribute and that is the authoritative source uh, for this particular thing. Um, I mean, Many people work on it, but I've not, not he heard of a large corporation like BNY Mellon where you actually have that full picture of wh what data is out there. Um, it's mainly in the head of people. So that's one one use case is to create those models and, and find the find basically create a picture of our data landscape. Where are all those data sets? How do we get the data from those data sets? How do we map it? And do that in an agile way. You can never do it in one go. Don't do it waterfall, etc. Uh, just get the data in there, and then massage it and make it better and better. Create, change the ontologies and and stitch it together because sometimes you don't even see that there's a that you can connect the dots across two different data sets until you actually worked on it and uh, and and one person looks into both data models and says, hey, this is actually the same as that. Why do we call it differently? Let's give it one name uh, and let's make it uh, let's make it uh, one object. So uh, why the next knowledge graph? Let me zoom in because I can't read it. Um, sorry. Okay.
Okay, so one, yeah, one reason is to uh, to go to a higher level of data management maturity uh, by creating this uh, knowledge graph. Uh, I mean, this sounds very presumptuous, and, uh, and so we first have to be successful with this project. But uh, the, the goal is to go to a higher level of uh, data level uh, data management maturity, where we um, where we can basically prove to the regulators in a machine readable way whatever they want to know that our data is has this right the right quality it comes from the right sources and all that um yeah another re a reason big reason is of course to create a holistic view across the whole uh, financial industry um and our the, the the goal is to create the largest knowledge graph of the whole financial industry uh, not just for beyond Van Mellen, but for what we call the Nexon universe, where you have all kinds of parties like other banks and financial service boutiques and all kinds of other uh, parties that would consume this data, uh, and that they, their data can also be added as well. Um, okay, let's skip this. So we're talking about not enterprise data unification, but industry data unification, and and that's why uh, the FIBO is a financial uh, is the financial industry business ontology. Uh, we use open standards, and I would like to add one that I didn't see yet in, the, in most slides. And so we have RDF, Owl, and Sparkle, of course. Those are the three pillars under under the semantic technology world. But there's a fourth one that's also very important, I think, that is the linked data standard. Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee came up with that himself, uh, and, uh, and I translated as um, these Nixon IRIs I, I discussed earlier. Um, so the IRI, the, of the URI, the URL, whatever you name it, uh, is not just an identifier, it's also a locator. That's a core principle of, of linked data. You have to be able to click on it. And that link has to be uh, available, has to be served for potentially decades. Uh, because especially in the combination with blockchain, you would put that link in the blockchain. You cannot store all your data in the blockchain. You can store a contract or a transaction in the blockchain. But, if you, uh, but, but that contract and transaction has to link to other data. And that other data needs to be immutable by temporal data. Because someone, let's say you make a, a, a transaction about a bond or, and it expires after five years, then, and then you get money. Uh, well, those links in the contract sh still have to work and should point to the same data that, that, that you had when you made that deal. So that's, that's one reason why I think the, the combination of uh, linked data and, and uh, the, the knowledge graph and, and, uh, and blockchain is, uh, is very good. Furthermore, the, uh, the data that we would provide uh, through Nexon data has to be resilient and secure. That's an important s slogan in, in our company at the moment. Uh, so it has to be elastic uh, and on demand and reactive. Uh, we use a reactive microservice architecture. Reactive is a whole different way of programming. It's, a, it's also a complete new paradigm change uh, of how you build systems. Uh, look, up, look up on the internet reactive manifesto and you'll see what I mean. Um, and then, of course, it has to be regulatory compliant. And I translate that to make the common sense thing, do the right thing. Do, uh, make sure that you know what your data means and that it has the right quality. Okay, very qu quickly, uh, Nexon data itself is the underlying platform that powers the, the knowledge graph. It's, uh, let's skip this one. Um, so we are using this reactive microservice architecture, Scala, Akka, is the same technology that underpins uh, technologies like uh, Spark and Kafka and Storm. It's all using, they're all using Scala and Akka. Uh, we want to have low latency, high throughput. Uh, we're thinking about creating uh, the real-time knowledge graph uh, where you have uh, where everything is in memory. Um, Okay, you can download this presentation uh, on the website. <laughs> we built, uh, yep. any questions? Jagabus? No, one? Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Jagabus will. Jakobus yeah. will be here for the next two weeks, so you can ask him as many questions as you want. 
Let's give him a hand.